right, let's get this show on the road. Hello, everyone. Hope you're well. Welcome to another edition of Math 1207. Hope you're all doing well today. Let's actually just um, jump right in because we were in the middle of something last time. Okay, so I think you're all seeing my screen. So let us. All right, let's begin. So um, what you're seeing is notes from last time. Figure I'd do a quick recap, even though um, we didn't learn many new things, but we spent a lot of time going over examples and hopefully that uh, actually helped you guys get into a flow and understand the method more. Um, but yeah, we spent more than half our time, I think, on integration by parts and it works via this formula where you choose the parts U and V. So uh, you choose the parts U and DV, and we choose them according to a mnemonic, which was, oh, that was actually, we saw the mnemonic in the previous lecture. Um, Leate, which tells you what order in which to pick the U component. Um, so L stands for logarithms, I stands for inverse functions, A stands for algebraic functions, which really means polynomials, T stands for trig functions, E stands for exponential functions. Once you choose the parts according to those rules, um, you can actually use this formula here, which I erased the D by accident, and you can actually transform your integral into, hopefully, an expression that's easier for you to compute. So the idea is the integral on the right side will be easier to compute than the integral on the left side, which is the one you actually want to compute. And we did a bunch of examples for that. Um, we saw that we can be in several scenarios also. So there could be a point where um, you just do integration by parts and it's good. You just do it one time, you're done. You might have to apply another method after that, but overall it's more straightforward, one application. We've also seen a situation where you do integration by parts a few times, but then you end up with like the original integral that you wanted to solve. But we know that to deal with that, you just move that integral to the other side and just solve it like an algebra equation. We also saw a situation where you can do integration by parts, but you have to do it repeatedly. Um, and eventually you'll get to an answer, but it just takes a long time to do that. And therefore we looked at something called tabular integration, which is, Integration by parts, exactly. It's just that it's done in an algorithmic kind of way that allows you to do repeated integration by parts a little bit easier and a little bit less annoying. And you won't have to worry as much about parentheses and making sure that you're expanding everything correctly. So that was pretty cool. We did a few examples using uh, tabular integration. We know how big to make our table when we're doing tabular integration. And we actually did a few examples where hopefully you can appreciate how long something like this would take writing out each integration by heart parts by hand, but it was actually pretty straightforward actually doing it with tabular integration. Of course, we remember that there are times when we can do integration by parts, but we end up in a situation where we might need another technique of integration to help, help us finish the problem. So in this case, we started out with integration by parts, but then we ended up needing to do a substitution. There are times when you might start off with a substitution, but then you end up needing integration by parts to finish it off. But at the end of the day, we do know what we're doing in terms of integrals, hopefully. Um, one thing I want you to always keep in mind, never forget, is this, uh, this art of integration strategy that we talk about, what to do first, what to do second, what to do third, what to do afterwards. So you always try to apply a basic rule first. If that doesn't work, you always try to simplify, see if you can apply a basic rule first. If that doesn't work, you always try a substitution third. You always do think about doing these things before doing anything like integration by parts or anything more sophisticated. Once you've exhausted these options, then you think of more sophisticated methods. And it doesn't say that you'll never use these options because again, we have situations where we wanted to start off with integration by parts, but we ended up needing something else afterwards because you end up with a new integral in computing your original integral, which required you to start the process all over again. Every time you see a new integral, you go through this process in your head. It doesn't matter what technique you've applied up to this point, an integral pops up, you always think these things in that order. The first three things you do is always those three things I mentioned. And it doesn't matter which integral shows up, when it shows up, where it shows up, 
that's how you go about taking down an integral. You always start with those three methods. Now, beyond that, uh, we are learning, of course, techniques to deal with more complicated integrals, but you always start there and you always go through that process in your head. So we finished integration by parts. Remember how we should attack integrals. And then we started looking at trig integrals. So this is section 7.2 in our text. And we started off with some basic integrals that I just expect you to know how to deal with, like how to integrate tangent squared, tangent, how to integrate secant. Um, this one I expect you to just know as a basic rule. Um, don't really want to go through that every time. Just kind of know that that's the answer. Um, there is a corresponding integral with cosecant. But as I mentioned, I'm not really going to ask you much or ask you to memorize anything dealing with cosecants or cotangents. If you know secants and tangents, I will be happy um, because cosecants and cotangents are very similar. They just have like negative signs in certain situations. And then we started talking about trig integrals of a specific form. And we got through all but one case of the first form when you have a product of sines and cosines with uh, integer powers. And essentially the idea so far was if we have one of the trig integrals with an odd power, you save one of those factors, transform everyone else into the other trig function, and then do a U substitution for the other trig function. And then that guy that you have left over is gonna be a part of your DU. Um, in the event that both are odd, which we did deal with that case, then you save a factor of the smaller one, and that would make your life computationally easier, right? So the idea is you always want to save one of the odd factors to use as your du and transform everyone else into the other trig function when you're dealing with sines and cosines. But then we end up with a situation like, well, what if they're both even? You don't have an odd factor to actually save one to make your du. Well, in this case, you apply the double angle formula, and this will allow you to turn an even power into an odd power essentially. So you'll notice that over here, the angle is double, but the power on the trig function is actually one, which is an odd power. So here is how you can actually get your odd powers in there when you actually don't have them to begin with. Um, it is by using the half angle formula. I don't know why the iPad does that. Like if I undo something, it springs me back to the last place I wrote something, whatever. Um, so yeah, so that is the last uh, case that we had to deal with. We didn't do any examples. We kind of ran out of time, but I asked you guys to try these on your own uh, to see how they go. So that's where we are right now. So that brings us to today, lecture four, um, where we're kind of almost done with this one. Almost. And we're actually going to finish that up now with these examples. And I know what happened here. Yeah, seriously. Okay. Sometimes I wonder about this thing. We're almost done. All right, so now we're all caught up. I did a very quick review, but of course we spent like three hours on the stuff last time. So um, I expect you to be okay with that. Let's actually jump into it. So what do we do here? What did you try? Um, you use the double angle formulas to transform the cosine squared x okay. into one half. What is it? Uh, one half parentheses one plus cosine of two x. Mm -hmm. Right, so transform that to that. And now 
Um, how do you integrate one? Oh, that's this X. How do you integrate cosine of two X? What's that gonna be? Negative two sine two X. One half sine two X plus C. It's going to be one half sine two x, right? So it's not two because that would be the derivative, but in this case you divide by um, the derivative. You don't always do that, by the way. So I just maybe I should point that out because that is a mistake that I've seen students make. So why can we do that? So there are a couple of things that we can know from substitution. So for example, we know from substitution that if you know that the integral of f of x dx is equal to big F of x plus C, then if you have F of say a linear function of x, ax plus b dx, that's going to give you one over a F of ax plus b plus C. So you don't really change what the answer would look like. You just actually, you know that instead of x, you're gonna have your ax plus b, and then you're going to divide by the a. And the reason is, is by u equals ax plus b, which means that your du is going to be a dx, which means that your one over a du is going to be dx. And that leads you to one over a times the integral of f of u du, which you know is going to be big F of u plus C. So what that means is the following. You kind of know in your head that if you have a linear composite function, right, where the function that's plugged inside something is a linear function, then you can kind of ignore that function, just divide by the coefficient of X and uh, write out what the answer would have been with that function. So in other words, um, I know that the integral of say cosine x dx is sine x dx, uh, sine x plus c. That means if I have any linear function of cosine, like say cosine of seven x plus nine, I automatically know that this is just gonna be one over seven of sine of seven x plus nine. Right, like I don't need to waste my time going through a substitution because this is a linear function. Now, of course, if this were like an x squared plus nine, I would be in trouble. I wouldn't be able to do something the same. But uh, substitution tells me that if it's a linear function, you just divide by the slope and you essentially just follow through with what the formula would look like, but replacing your x with whatever the linear function is. And you can do that in your head. Like if I see like an integral of like cosine of seven x plus nine, like I don't expect you to go through like a substitution to do that, even though technically speaking, that's what you should do. You should just know, like, oh, the answer is just one over seven times the sine function. Similarly, if you, if you have like uh, um, e to the three x plus seventeen dx, you know that the answer is just going to be one third e to the three x plus seventeen. Right? Like you don't need a substitution for that because right? the power in the e is a linear function. Right, you would have done u equals three x plus seventeen, du equals three dx, one third du equals dx. You plug it in, you get one third e to the u du. You integrate that, you just get one third e to the u. Right, so I I don't expect you to have to deal with that. Um, you the this stops working immediately if you don't have a linear function. But when you have a linear function, you can do that shortcut and you can do it in your head. I don't expect you to like write out a substitution. So you can jump straight from this guy to that guy without actually doing anything. So, um, 
this means that if I have like the integral of cosine of 2x dx, that's just going to be 1 over 2 the sine of 2x plus c. And that's what I put in here. So that's just a quick pro tip in terms of um, sort of what I would expect. So I should probably mention that here. I don't require you to write out the substitution. For problems like this. That being said, there's always this caveat, right? Like, if I'm saying, you know what, I'm fine with you skipping these steps, just, you know, get to the problem. But uh, you as a student, if you skip those steps, you get confused and you might forget something or leave something off or get the problem wrong because of it, then don't skip the steps, right? I, I want that to be clear. Like just because I'm saying it's okay to skip steps, don't force yourself to skip the steps. It's just know that you're allowed to. If you want to write everything out, there's no harm, no foul. I'd rather you just write out everything that you need to. And you know, if it takes you two extra lines to get to a, an answer, I'm fine with it. Um, but don't try to skip steps on purpose just because, well, Javon said I should probably know how to skip steps here. I like, don't do that, right? Just know that if you're writing it out, I will not expect you to like do a bunch of substitutions here. I'd be okay for you to skip from one line to the next line. Because students are always concerned about, well, how much work am I supposed to show? Right, so I want to tell you guys how much I expect to see. So something like if your substitution would be a linear function, I don't expect you to have to show that or do it. I kind of expect you to be able to do it in your head, but if you can't, write it out anyway. Don't be a hero. This is not about looking fancy. I, I care more about you getting it correct and knowing what's going on. Okay. Um, now this one, the uh, sine of two, Let's kind of, kind of, let's put this below here. Now, sine squared is actually very similar, so it's not going to turn a big deal. So you'd solve that by just re applying the half angle formula. This would be one minus cosine two x. Um, but the uh, yeah. Plus C. It's just with a negative sign in the middle, so that's that's that. Okay, let's do a slightly more interesting one. So we have cosine squared x sine squared x. What do you think we do here? Will be the first step. By the double angle formulas. Okay. And what would we get here? Um, so I wasn't sure if I should pull the one halves of both of them out mm -hmm. to the front. And then would that be like one quarter in the front or just be one half? Be one quarter, right? Because there are two of them. Yeah. 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 So then it's um, parentheses one plus cosine two X parentheses 
1 minus cosine 2x dx. Okay, now what? So now we go through our thing. Is this a basic rule? We say no. Can we simplify it to be a basic rule? How could we simplify this? Quote unquote. Multiply it together. You can multiply it out, right? Um, so this looks like difference of squares, right? A plus B times A minus B. So it's gonna be one squared minus this guy squared. Now what? One thing you could notice, there are many things, but one thing you could notice, like one minus cosine squared is what? Well, it's a sine squared, right? This all reduces to that. Which, by the way, there's another option here. You could also have said that, well, this is just cosine x sine x all squared. And notice that cosine x sine x, there's actually a, another double angle formula there. Um, that's actually just one half sine two x. Remember sine two x is equal to two cosine x sine x. And then you can square that. You square the one half, you get a quarter. And then you square that, you can get here as well. So, or that was another option. If you saw that, that would be fine. But eventually we'll get here. So now we have like a, a sine squared 2x. What do we do with that?
it is double angle formula again mm -hmm. and what would you get um so it'd be one eighth outside and then integral of one minus cosine two x which you can then integrate no it wouldn't no. be two x It wouldn't be. No. Okay. What would it be? Would the two x be a constant and then you just have like two? No. It's the double angle formula, right? You double the angle. So it'll be four x. Right? You you double the angle, whatever it is, right? So it's like a sine squared theta. Is equal to one half one minus cosine of two theta, right? Whatever theta is, you double the angle. Um, so that's four x. And based on the above, we know how to deal with this now. So this is just one fourth. It's not a plus it's a minus. Uh, sine four x. I'll be that one. So every time you see a trick function to an even power, the answer is kind of, you know, the same. Like you see a cosine of sines to even powers, you always apply the double angle formula. And it, to apply them, you literally double the angle. Okay. So if we had like a 3x here, it'll become 6x once you apply the double angle formula, et cetera. And yeah. So you have this one, um, and it's going to essentially be the same strategy. We only have even powers, so we're going to apply the double angle formulas. Mm -hmm. So, of course, uh, the sine to the fourth x, you think of sine squared x squared, so you're applying the double angle formula like two times. So you're going to get a quarter constant factor from that. Applying the double angle formula for the cosine squared, you're going to get a half factor, so this ends up being one eighth out here and end up with one minus cosine two x squared times one plus cosine two x. And of course here would just multiply out. So this is essentially one minus cosine two x times one minus cosine squared two x. is one uh, minus cosine two x to the one multiplier everybody and minus cosine two x plus cosine cubed two x. And we would deal with this again uh, separately. So here we have a cosine squared again. So we'd want to break that down a little bit more. This is one. Um, Cosine cubed, we actually know how to deal with something like that, right? That's, uh, I would leave that as cosine squared 2x times cosine. which I mean, 
I'm actually making this a little bit more annoying than it has to be, I think. Let's do what we did last time, because this guy, I could just think of it as sine squared 2x. Have less terms when I multiply out. It might be nice. Um, so here I have sine squared 2x minus sine squared 2x cosine 2x. That looks nicer. I think I can start integrating now. So this would end up being um, x minus a quarter sine 4x to this one. I have the cosine factor out there. So I'm just going to do a u equals sine. Um, the du would be cosine. So this should end up with. Uh, Something like one half sine cubed two x. I can write this out. So here I would have u equals sine two x. My du would be two cosine two x dx. So this is one half du equals cosine two x dx. And so this would become one half times sine times u squared um, du. So this just becomes one half u cubed over three, which the two and the three can make this into a one sixth here. This is a long one, but I think we made it as short as we could here. Um, but as you can see, the thing is, depending on what trig uh, identities you want to apply and when, you can make a problem longer or shorter. I think we pretty much have one of the shorter ways here. Um, any questions on this one? So anytime I have only an even power of uh, sine or cosine, apply the half angle formula, simplify and regroup if I want, right? Because the moment I apply the half angle formula and I get somewhere, then I start over. Is it a basic rule? Can I simplify to be a basic rule? So I simplify. Uh, is it a basic rule? Can I simplify to be a basic rule? So I simplify. Is it a basic rule? Can I simplify to be a basic rule? So I simplify. Once I get here, I'm like, oh, now I have a strategy, right? We know that the strategy here takes effect and the strategy here takes effect from what we learned last class. So I pretty much keep using trig identities to break things down until I get to a point, all right, I see what I need to do now. I, I'm in a situation where it's not really a basic rule, but I have a straightforward strategy from for dealing with this guy. We have the machinery. We have the technology. We can we can we go. So that would be that one. And I mean, I, you can like expand parentheses a little bit if you wanted to, but this is fine. Multiply that and get it like a one sixteenth or something. Was that the last one? 
Oh, that was the last one. Yeah. We ended with a bang. <laughs> All right. So uh, I think we need to go to another one of our sections here. What do we have? I mean, since we're dealing with sines and cosines, I think we'll just jump to part three first, um, as opposed to part two. So let's do part three. Okay, so the idea is the following. There's no real general method here, so I can't give you like a step-by-step -step thing, which I, again, it's, it's one of those things you have to get used to <laughs> after Calc 2. Like in Calc 1, everything had a step-by-step -step method for doing, oh yeah, you always do the step one, do that step two, do the step three. Yeah, Calc 1 is like that. In Calc 2, we're, we're, we're getting away from that. Where, you know, it's, there's an art to certain things. So I would say here, there's no general method. So one thing that we saw was common throughout all the things that I explained before is we kind of want to get into a situation where either we can directly integrate the thing because it's the basic rule, or we've isolated one of the trig functions and we can write the other part in terms of the other trig function so that a substitution would give us that remainder as a DU. You're going to try to apply the same principle here. Um, try to isolate one of the trig um, functions to be a du if possible. Right, so other than that, I can't really tell you anything generally. So an example would be like this one, right? So let's say I have something like a cosine cubed x over the square root of the sine of x. Okay. So here we're in a situation where we have non-integer powers for our trig function. So for example, the sine function has a one half power on it, right? It's not an integer. So it's not like I can get something nice um, in terms of the previous strategies. But at the same time, you can kind of see how knowing the previous strategies can help. So for example, seeing that there's a cosine cubed here gives me the idea, well, I can isolate one of the cosines, I'll get a cosine squared, I can change that cosine squared into sine function, into a function of sine. And then because of that cosine squared that I have left over at that point, a substitution might be beneficial. And that's kind of exactly what we would do here. So. So here I leave this as a cosine squared times a cosine. And then I can just do like a one minus sine squared. And now you see with that cosine off isolated to the side, I can now do a substitution for the sine function and um, my cosine dx would be the du function. And I will, and I'd have something that's a lot more manageable, right? So at this point, I can do something like a, a u squared equals sine. T 
2u du would be cosine x dx. And then I would get 1 minus u to the fourth over u times, well, 2u du. Those guys would cancel. So I'd end up with 2 times integral of 1 minus u to the fourth. Right? which is a, it's a very nice integral, right? That's something that you can, you have a basic rule for. You can use the, uh, the power rule. So in this case here, u is the radical of sine. So this is going to be, two times the square root of sine x minus sine to the five over two power over five. That would be right, and that would be your uh, your answer right there. Um, any questions on that one? Or hopefully, even though we don't really have a general method for this, hopefully you kind of see where knowing a general method for an easier case kind of gives me the ideas that I would need to deal with a, a little bit more complicated case, right? So you kind of try the same, you play the same game with trying to isolate one of these trig functions. To get that substitution to work. And I guess, I mean, to deal with uh, some students might like a more traditional substitution. So something like a u equals sine, your du would be equal to cosine x dx. And so you would end up with the integral of one minus u squared over the radical of u du which is going to be, well, now you'd have to write like u to the minus one half, and this would be u to the two minus a half, which is three halves, um, u to the minus one half, u three halves. So now you apply the power rule, you add one to the power, divide by the new power here you add one to the power you divide by the uh, new power and now your u was the sine function so you end up with two sine to the one half minus two fifths uh, sine to the five halves plus c, which is the, the same answer. But I sort of did the substitution I did because I, I just wanted to avoid the fractions and the power. Um, it's just annoying enough for me to want to avoid them. It's not like, a, it's not the end of the world, but. If I'm in the middle of a test, I don't want to have to worry about dealing with fractions when I don't have to. So yeah, at the end of the day, that's going to be your answer. So, I mean, other than that, like, there's nothing really else for me to say here. Like if you have a bunch of sines and cosines mixed together, you kind of drift into this situation where I kind of want to isolate a sine or a cosine by themselves and change everyone to the other guy 
right? So if I isolate a cosine, figure out a way to change everyone else to a sine and do a substitution. If I isolate a sine, figure out how to change everyone else to a cosine, do a substitution. It's kind of the, um, the direction you want to go in. Now let's deal with something a uh, little more interesting. Um, so this is when we have the form of secants. Secant to the M. Tangent to the N. DX dot form. So here I'm going to do some uh, subcases, and the moment I do these subcases, you're gonna you're gonna see that um, we're not in a nice situation like sines and cosines. So subcases. Wait, did I did I number these subcases or did I letter them? I I, I use letters. So A. So here's one subcase when you have secants and tangents together, right? And at this point, we're assuming M and N are integers. And the same idea would apply if we know how to deal with the integer case very well, then we can kind of use the lessons that we learned from that to deal with non-integer power cases. Um, but essentially, here are the, the situations. M, M is even, right? So you have an even uh, power of secant. And if you only have secants and there's an even power, um, you might end up in a case like, for example, just the integral of secant squared, which is easy. That's a basic rule, right? We know that the derivative of tangent is secant squared. So the integral of secant squared is going to be tangent. But this is particularly useful when there's not just a secant squared and all by itself. You will, might have like a tangent attached to it. So especially when tangent is present, say visibly present. And I would guess M is greater than or equal to four. Or oh, let's keep that at two. Okay, so that's going to be a situation. So like you have a secant squared times a tangent, right? Secant squared by itself is not a big deal. But if you have a secant squared times a tangent, it's a little bit more sophisticated. Um, not much, because obviously the thing to do there would be U equals tangent your secant squared would be the du. And that's kind of where we're going with this case. That's kind of where you want to go. Isolate the secant squared, change everyone else to tangents and make that substitution. Um, there's a second situation um, that you can deal with. Um, N is odd. Especially in the case when uh, secant is visibly present. Okay. Now we have seen situations where n was odd, but there wasn't a secant visibly present. Um, or maybe I'm going to show you that. Yeah, like tangent and then a substitution could work there. But something like a tangent cubed, for example, might be a situation where um, you don't see a secant, but you can think of it as being there in the background. Um, let's see. And there's a third category, um, which here is going to be, um, we're going to get very specific, super specific here, everything else. So you can already see that it's kind of already getting kind of muddled here. And that's just the nature of secants and tangents. 
which is another reason why I don't want you to worry about a whole other set of formulas with cosecants and cotangents. They're going to work very similar. Secants and tangents already provide a more challenging environment for us to work in. So if you have an odd power of secant, that is generally a favorable. If you have an even power of secant, that's generally a favorable thing. If you have an odd power of tangent, generally a favorable thing, in particular when the other trig function is present. And then you kind of have every other situation. So the combinations of odds and evens powers kind of works uh, differently. Um, so those are the situations we're going to deal with. So let's deal with uh, case A. Uh, so you have secant to an even power times tangent to some other power. So the steps here are the following. You're going to try to save a factor of secant squared. Two, you want to change all other trig functions to tangent. Of course, you're gonna be using the Pythagorean identities. So we know that one plus tangent squared is equal to secant squared. Three, now you're going to substitute. Uh, U equals tangent. Four, integrate. So of course, um, in the event that you don't have any other secants present, you just have a secant squared, that's a basic rule. So we don't need this to think of this scenario. Um, but in the event that you do have other secants, you're gonna try to change them all to tangents because a u equals tangent is gonna give you that secant squared x as a du. And so you can actually move forward there and it's going to look more algebraic-ish in nature. Um, so let's actually do some examples. Like a secant to the fourth, for example. Okay. So here we're in a situation where the power of secant is even. There's no other tangent that's visibly present, but our m is greater than or equal to two. So it tells us how to proceed. We are going to save a factor of secant squared. Right, so we're going to move this off to the side. And in our minds, we're going to earmark that as our du. Now, any other secant that's present, you're going to change it to tangents, and you're going to change it using that identity. So this is going to be 1 plus tangent squared. And now you're going to do that substitution, u equals tangent. Your du is going to be that secant squared dx. So then you'll just end up with the integral 1 plus u squared du. So that's your u, and that's your du here. That's something you can use a basic rule on. So it's u plus u cubed over three plus c, u is tangent. And that's going to be your answer.
So that's the antiderivative of uh, secant to the fourth. Any questions on this one? Clear how I did that. Let's do another one. Okay, tell me some ideas for that one. What would you do here? Put the secant to the side and then turn everything else into tangents. Okay, what would that look like? It would look like tangent squared x times one plus tangent squared x times secant squared x dx. Right. Um, let's let me add one more line to that. But you're correct. So, just to make sure that everyone is following. So you factored off a secant squared, moved it to the side, and then that secant squared you change it to one plus ten squared times that tan squared times that secant squared, which is what you said, right? Which it's fine to skip the, the middle line. I just wanna be a little bit more explicit. Um, you know, put that in a different color. Okay, so I slide it off, a, a, a slide off a secant squared, put it at the end. I'm left over with a secant squared, um, change, once you have that secant squared off to the side, change every other secant to tangents. And at this point, now you're in prime position to do the, your substitution, u equals tangent. du is going to be that secant squared that we moved off to the side. And so this is just going to become 1 plus u squared times u squared du. So that's going to become u squared plus u to the fourth du. That's going to become u cubed over 3 plus u to the fifth over 5. And that's our guy. Okay, so that's uh, one situation. Power of secant is even. You try to put yourself into this position. Getting a secant squared off to the side somewhere. Let's go to case B. You have secant to some power, but your tangent is to an odd power. So we're kind of going to play the same game here. 
we want, um, and particularly uh, CCAM present. We want to put ourselves in a situation that's advantageous for something like a substitution or some other method to take effect. And in this case, when the power of tangent is odd, it turns out the better thing to aim for, generally speaking, is going to be to save a factor of secant x times tangent x. Secant x tangent x, you might remember, is the derivative of secant, right? The derivative of secant is secant x tangent x. And so the idea would be change everyone else to uh, secants. You're going to do that, of course, using the same identity, you know, that uh, one plus tangent squared. Yeah. Is secant squared three. Now you're going to make a substitution. You're going to do u equals secant. Four, integrate. Integrate, of course, every time you see the word integrate, you're thinking of that strategy that I mentioned to you before. Is it a basic rule? Can I simplify to make it a basic rule? Do I get another substitution? Well, that sort of thing. Go through that whole process again, because at this point you'll have an entirely new integral and you kind of start from scratch in, in figuring out what to do. So as an example here, let's do uh, secant times a tangent cubed. So this puts you in uh, that sort of situation. Okay. So what I would do here, save a factor of secant tangent. So this is gonna look like tangent squared. And I move off a secant tangent to the side. Any remaining tangents, I'm gonna change the secants using that rule. So this is secant squared minus one. Now I'm gonna do u equals secant. My du is going to be secant x tangent x. So I would end up with the integral of u squared minus one du. So you give me u cubed over three minus u plus c. And u was secant. So this is secant cubed over three minus secant x plus c. So you have power of tangent is odd. You see secants elsewhere. You factor off one of the secants, factor off one of the tangents. You end up with a secant tangent to the right side. Um, you're going to think of that as your du. So that's earmarked. Get everyone else to be secants. You can do that using the uh, Pythagorean identity. At that point, u equals secant will give you a, fun, a, a non trig function in terms of u, and hopefully you can actually deal with that easier. So, 
the other example we're going to do is this guy, but I actually think we're about due for a break here. So we'll stop. We'll pause here for a second. have any more examples of this case? No. And then we're, after this example, we're going to do the final case of uh, this scenario. And then that's going to be fun. Um, okay, yeah. So we'll pause right here, take a five minute break, just to, you know, stretch your legs, uh, wash your face, get a drink, and we will be back and dealing with uh, this guy. All right, we're back. Let's actually, let's do this. All right, so we have secant cube, tangent cube. What do we do here? Try to write a sequence, uh, sequence x, tan x. Mm -hmm. So we'd be left with secant squared, tangent squared, and to the side we have a secant x, tan x. All right, now what? Well, we know we want this to be our du, which means um, we want everyone else to be secants. So the next step is actually change that tangent uh, to be a secant, which in this case is going to be secant squared minus one. Then we're going to do a u equals secant. The du is going to be secant x tan x. And so you're going to have the integral of u squared times u squared minus 1 du. u to the fourth minus u squared du. u to the fifth over five minus u cubed over three plus c, and your u was a secant. So that would be the integral here. This leads us to the final case we want to deal with here, C. So it's like uh, the integrals of secant tangent dx um, m not even 
and not odd. Right, so everything other than the previous two cases that we just did. And um, so the steps here, okay. So here are gonna be the steps, you guys ready? Pay attention to this. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna try something. Going to see if it works. And third, if not, try something else. I'm only half joking. That's that's literally <laughs> there is no standard approach at this point. Um, you kind of you're gonna try stuff, um, and with experience you'll kind of get a feel for the kinds of things you want to try before trying something else. And it's just a matter of you kind of thinking about, okay, do it again, going through the art of integration order. You're going to, the third thing you're going to think about if there aren't basic rules is, can I get a substitution to work? So it's probably going to be one of the first things you want to try. Can I finagle things so that I can get a U equals secant or a U equals tangent substitution to work out in my favor. Am I able to isolate a secant squared or am I able to isolate a secant tangent? It's kind of where you want to look at first. Um, but generally speaking, there isn't going to be, oh, this is always the best thing to kind of do first. It's just, it's something you have to figure out on the fly. Um, and it can range from easy problems to hard problems. So. Yeah, we're already in territory where it's kind of like, yeah, you kind of got to figure it out. <laughs> That's life, kids. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Okay, um, so let's uh, try one. Tangent cubed. Um, so we've dealt with the situation where the tangent had an odd power, but we had a secant somewhere else where we could factor off a secant tangent, right? Did we do secant times tan cube? We did, right? The fact that there was the secant there kind of made things interesting, right? The fact that it was secant present kind of made it straightforward. We could factor off a secant tangent, we're good. Here, we don't have that secant to help us out, okay? So what do we do? We try something, <laughs> that's what you're gonna try. So, I mean, uh, give me some ideas here. Tell me what your intuition is telling you to try. give up, run away. No, not that. We'd never give up, right? Like, we're gonna, we're gonna beat this guy. Like, what do we do? Tell me something you think might be worth trying. Taking the tan out and putting it to the side. Okay. Um, any reason why you think that was a good thing to try? What, what, what was your gut feeling telling you here? We did it before. We did it before. <laughs> right. So one thing your your gut would be telling you why you might want to do this is because you know a formula that deals with the square power, right? It deals with, and, and generally, if you know something that deals with a square power, you can kind of figure out something that would deal with any even power, right? So if you see like a tangent cubed, you're like, uh, can I get a square in there somewhere? Because that might allow me to do a substitution and maybe I can figure something out. So that might be something. It's very weird dealing with a tangent cubed. You don't really know a formula off the top of your head for a tangent cubed. You do for a tangent squared. So it might be like, uh, maybe I'll just, you know, split that into a tangent squared minus times tangent, right? At this point, you're like, well, what can I do now? Well, I kind of know that I can't do anything with a tangent squared and a tangent. So maybe if I change this to a secant squared minus one, and that's a tangent, that can do something. Okay. What do you think we can do here? A lot of secant x. So they have secant x tangent x on the right. 
uh, you you can't. The minus one is there, right? So you can't. Oh, really, yeah. It's not right. a common term. What else? We can do u substitution. U equals what? The secant squared for the tangent. Well, if u equals tangent, your du is going to be a secant squared, but there's this minus one again that's the issue. Like you don't have a, you, your secant squared isn't a factor. You have a minus one beside it. Um, can you multiply it out? Yeah, so now you multiply that out. And of course, you can think of these as two separate integrals, of course. And now in this one, if you think of this as its own separate integral, like it's this dx, you do have a secant squared as a factor. Um, so the idea is, of course, if you don't have a factor um, of one guy that might be useful to have a factor, one thing you can try is to just multiply out. He's going to be a factor on one part of the thing. And then I'll just try to figure out something for the other part of the thing, right? So this is where it comes from. When I say try something, I mean like you actually try something that might make sense, might put you in a better position. So the first thing I tried was this because, well, I'd rather deal with a tangent squared than a tangent cube. That's all, I, that's as far as I thought, you know? And, and when I got here, I'm like, well, you know, tangent and tangent isn't great. Tangent works well with secant. So can I get a secant in here? Well, yeah, I can get it from this guy, right? So, and then I'm here. Now it's like, all right, I'm in a situation where like a u equals tangent would be nice, but I need a secant squared factor, not a secant minus one. So then multiplying out becomes the next thing that you might want to try. And that way, now we have two pieces to this integral where each piece can uh, work out very nicely. In fact, here, I can do a u equals tangent. And my du is going to give me that secant squared. Here, this is actually a basic rule, right? We we know this is like ln of secant or it's minus ln of cosine. So of course, my u was tangent, my du would be a secant squared. So I just have the integral of u du. So that's going to give me u squared over 2, which in this case is going to be 10 squared over 2. And this is going to be minus ln of secant. So yeah, you try something, but not blindly, right? You try something because of, you know about these other standard techniques that you have, and you try to get to something that approximates those techniques, kind of put you in a, a situation where you know how to deal with, right? Having a tangent cubed, I don't know how to deal with. A tangent squared is better. All right, if I have a tangent squared and a bunch of tangents, that's not great. It would be nice if I have some secants around. So you might want to change some of those guys to secants, right? If you need a du factor and there's a bunch of stuff beside it, multiply out the parentheses, you'll get that factor. You can do your du thing on that part. And then the other parts, there'll be smaller things to worry about later, right? So you kind of try something, you kind of see where it leads. Every step of the way, you kind of do something to get into a position where it would be nice to be in this position because I kind of know how to deal with that, right? So it's not really like a standard uh, technique, right? It's just like, you know about some standard situations and you try to get it into those situations as much as possible, right? Um, and that's sort of uh, how you want to do things. Okay. Let's go for another one. So tangent cubed seemed to work out not too bad, 
How about secant cubed? Okay. Ideas on secant cubed. We turn it into a secant squared by taking it out one of the secants. Okay, seems to make sense. Secant squared times secant. Now we have to turn them into tangents somehow. Okay. Um, well, we can change a secant squared into a tangent, right? This is just going to be one plus tan squared. Then we might want to say multiply this out. Okay, so we have a secant, which we know how to integrate that. We have a that's a basic rule. Then we have the secant tangent squared. So now we're in a situation where, all right, so this guy is okay. We don't, we don't really need to worry about it. But what about this guy over here? All right, so if I pull off a secant tangent, which might be something that you're thinking about, I'd be left over with a tangent, which is a problem because my du would require me to have secants. And I can't really change a tangent to a secant unless I throw in a plus or a minus radical in there, it's not gonna be pretty. We don't know how to integrate something like that anyway. So leaving a tangent squared, you might think, okay, so maybe at this point I can change this to a secant. And I would multiply that out. I would get a secant cubed minus a secant. But then you kind of end up in a situation where this cancels that, and you kind of end up back where you started. You don't really, can't really get anywhere. So um, that was actually a very good first attempt, but this is not going to get us anywhere. So let's not do that. Okay. So turns out that was an unfruitful thing. What else could we try? Um, can you do integration by parts? By parts, try something, right? So you, you realize, okay, me trying to finagle these trig functions is, isn't gonna work in my favor because I mean, it's just a weird thing to deal with, but I do have one function times another function. So now it's like, mm, maybe a parts thing would work because that works with products of things. Um, sure, what would your parts be though? So again, we're trying integration by parts, but again, you can recognize we're not in a standard situation here. Liotte doesn't apply because we have two trig functions. Who gets to be the U, who gets to be the DV is probably going to be um, something you kind of want to try in a, in a way that it kind of makes your life easier as opposed to harder, which is what Liotte really tries to do. So what would the parts here be? Like who would you choose you and who would be your DV? Um, I would make the U 
um, secant x and the dv secant squared x. All right, because we know a nice formula to integrate that. That's just a tangent. And we know how to differentiate that. That's a secant x tan x. Right. That seems like a nice approach. If I, you had chosen the other way and made the u the secant squared, to differentiate that, you need the chain rule. You get 2 times secant x tangent x. That just feels like something that's harder to work with. And on top of that, if you made the dv secant, the V would be ln of absolute value of secant x plus tangent x. Like, like you don't feel like that's getting you somewhere better, right? Um, but doing it this way, we get some nice trick functions out of it. Everything is very compact. So this is, if we're going to work out with an integration by parts, this is probably um, the way that it's going to work. So yeah, sort of uncharted territory, but that seems to make sense. So we're going to go in, we're going to plug in our U times V. Um, minus the integral of v du. And we end up here. Sorry, so this part we don't have to worry about, um, but how do we deal with that one? So now I sort of think, is this one of our previous nice cases? Um, is the power of secant even? No. It's the power of tangent odd? No. So we're kind of, again, in uncharted territory. Um, you might want to think, can I do sort of an integration by parts again? And you might think something like, OK, maybe do a secant tangent and a tangent. Maybe I could do like the dv equals secant tangent, the du. The, the v would be just secant. I made the u tangent, the du would be like an ln again, right? And I'm already worrying about trig functions. I don't want to worry about natural logs of trig functions. Probably not what you want to do. So you might want to think something else. Um, so I'll tell you the way we would go here. I would actually change this tangent to a secant squared minus one. Now I do understand that we did a similar maneuver earlier and it didn't work out in our favor, but uh, here it actually will um, because the, the issue that happened last time is not going to happen this time. And I, I don't know if you, you noticed that. So the idea of course would be If I multiply this out, I'm going to get my secant cubed, which probably makes your heart sink a little bit, but we're fine because we're also going to get a secant. And the issue last time was the guy here and the guy here cancel out, leaving us back with what we started. But notice that that doesn't happen here. Right? This actually is a completely different situation altogether. And um, yeah, so what do you think we should do at this point? Ideas. Um, can we do what we did in a previous lesson where we set it equal to I? Okay. 
So let's call this I, which means that this is also going to be I. So we know that our I was equal to this thing. So our I is equal to secant X, tan X minus I plus the integral of secant X dx. So we can, we can have then our two I is going to be secant X tan X plus the integral of secant X dx. Integral of secant x, that's a basic rule. It's ln of secant x plus tangent x. And so this means your i is one half secant x tangent x plus ln of secant x plus tangent x. Let's see. And in fact, at this point, I'm going to have a strange recommendation. I would actually recommend that you memorize this as a basic rule because uh, secant cubed actually shows up a bunch coincidentally. It's a very annoying thing to memorize, I do understand, but it's not as annoying as trying to figure it out every time and going through this whole back and forth, right? And on top of that, this kind of illustrates to you the sort of challenges that we have because tangent cubed wasn't this crazy, but secant cubed suddenly is, right? Like you, you can have such varying situations um, in this, in the everything else scenario, where it's like, man, you, you try something, you kind of get, try to get yourself in an advantageous situation. Sometimes you end up at a, a roadblock, you go back, you do it. Um, eventually, though, you do enough integrals, you'll kind of get an intuition for the things you might want to try. Um, and you kind of know, okay, if this path doesn't work out, don't panic. I can go back and try something else at this step and figure it out. But um, this is the standard derivation of the integral of secant cubed. So um, if you like Google integral of secant cubed, um, chances are this is going to be the method by which they show you how to find it. Um, so secant cubed is actually a very uh, important example of an integration by parts integral that is kind of not a Liate type integral. So when I mentioned that Liate works 99.9999% of the time, examples like this is what I was thinking about why I didn't give you like, this always works. We're not, we're not at that level anymore. Um, so yeah, that's uh, how we would deal with secant cubed. There are other methods, I think, in this class, yeah, we're gonna do something where there's another way to attack this, but this would be the standard approach for attacking this. And on top of that, I would probably recommend that you just kind of memorize that thing because secant cubed tends to show up when you least expect it in other scenarios. Um, let's do um, another one. So like uh, secant x tangent squared. ideas.
Um, I have a question. So can we use um, secant cubed as like one of the ones that we know now? Yeah, yeah. So basic rule for us now. Okay, so then um, can we change tan squared x to um, secant squared x minus one? Okay, so you multiply this out. This is just going to be the integral of secant cubed minus secant. Yeah, and secant cubed is a basic rule. You know, that's one half secant x tangent x plus ln of secant x plus tangent x minus the integral of secant x is ln of secant x plus tangent x plus c. Um, and we can have a plus one half the ln minus the ln. That's just negative one half the ln. So we can do this. Just to contract things a little more. So why I recommend remembering the secant cubed is you wouldn't want to have to do all this while doing this. I mean, um, secant cubed shows up often enough where you are in another situation, you might break it down and you can get to a part where there's a secant cubed. And rather than wanting to break that down further, you can just deal with the secant cubed on the spot. Um, that happens more often than not, <laughs> than, more often than you would think. Especially just the way, just the standard problems that you'll see in a calculus class, you know, especially if, like me, I'm going to avoid generally asking you about things with cosecants and cotangents. If I want to test you on something with secants and tangents only, and I don't want to be a super trivial problem, I mean, secant cubes show up in the, that scenario, right? Um, they show up in a lot of scenarios, actually, also. So there might be times when you're like, doing a certain integral in physics class and there'll be a secant cube popping up or in some random application, a secant cube just pops up. Now you know how to deal with it. Sorry, this might be a stupid question, but why don't the LNs secant x plus tan x cancel out if it's a plus and a minus? Oh, because one is being multiplied by a half, right? Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So it's actually positive a half ln minus the ln gives you negative a half the ln. Okay. And so thank the, you. yeah. So, so parentheses thing. Um, yeah. So those are the only two examples. I mean, if you go into the, uh, So you can practice a bunch of problems um, on that. So we're in section 7.2 at this point. So you can practice the problems for section 7.2. That's actually all I wanted to do in uh, 7.2. Um, I, will, I will just mention that the, the last case in the secants and tangents, um, case four functions of tangents and secants is kind of covered by that everything else case that I mentioned. So no need to actually worry about that. So if you're dealing with sines and cosines, thank your lucky stars. Things are a lot more straightforward. Um, almost every scenario, you kind of have, you kind of know where you're heading. 
once you get to secants and tangents, things immediately get a little bit more muddy, right? You, there are two very specific scenarios which you know how to deal with very well. And any other scenario is kind of like, can we try something? You see if it works, kind of try to, right? You kind of know from practicing what some nice situations are. And then you just kind of think, how can I get to that, those sort of situations? Right? There's, there's really nothing else. There's nothing straightforward that I can tell you. But it, it's the sort of thing where um, you, you practice enough, you'll start to see um, what to do, especially in like a standard Calc 2 class. I'm not going to ask you something crazy where you need some sort of, you know, 250 IQ to figure it out. Like if you if you play around with things and tinker with things enough, you, you'll be okay. But uh, yeah. So it's actually all I want to do with 7.2. So we're going to actually move on to another section, uh, 7.3, where we're going to talk about trig substitution. So this for us is a whole other technique, right? So it's kind of in the line of integration by parts, right? So it's another technique altogether, right? So before with the trig integrals in 7.2, we didn't really learn new techniques. We just learned strategies for getting into advantageous positions using techniques we already know, like substitution or integration by parts. But this on its own is a whole other technique called trig substitution, short for trigonometric substitution. Um, and it's essentially going to be a variation, uh, a trig variation on what you know as substitution, which I hopefully already kind of primed you for, because you'll realize that sometimes it's advantageous not to just go with a regular, what we're used to u substitution, u equals blah. Sometimes you want to get a little bit more sophisticated, like a u squared. There are even going to be times where you're going to want to have a trig function on the left side here, and that's going to be an advantageous thing to have. And that is what brings us to the trig substitution scenario. It's going to be a way to use a trig function as the thing we're substituting in, and that's going to make things nicer for us. So we're kind of going to expand on this idea that we can be a little bit more sophisticated with our substitutions. And in and there's a whole thing. <laughs> that goes along with that, just people using crazy substitutions to figure out integrals. In a standard Calc 2 class, trig substitution is going to be one of the main ones. I'm actually going to teach you something else called the Weierstrass substitution. And yeah, that's pretty much all the fancy substitutions we're going to do. Um, and our other techniques are going to be like di different, but trig substitution, that's going to be the thing. So Sort of to motivate it, uh, maybe lead with some examples. So we've seen that we can make some more sophisticated. than the straightforward students like to refer to as U substitution, which is actually a bad name, but I guess um, you'll just run with it so you kind of have an idea of what I'm talking about. So here's an example. Let's say I wanted to do this integral. Okay, so that's my integral. Now here's what say typical um, calc student approach. Right, so you'll go in and you'll be like, okay, is this a basic rule? Nah, can I simplify it to be a basic rule? With that radical in the denominator, probably not. 
can a substitution work? Um, and here you might realize that, okay, if I sort of realize that um, I can think of my I as like an X squared times an X in the numerator. Then if I do my U equals this guy, my DU is going to be sort of like that guy with a constant factor in front, of course. And so you can uh, do that. So you can do a U equals one plus X squared. Your DU is going to be two X DX. So you're going to have that one half DU is equal to X DX. Then, um, of course, this would also mean that where I see an X squared, I can put U minus one. And so I'm just going to go in and swap those guys out. So the X squared is going to be a U minus one. My X DX is going to be a one half DU. In the denominator, I'm going to have a radical U. So at that point, I can be like, all right, I'm a half here. And I have like a U minus one over a square root of U. Start the process over again. Is that a basic rule? Nah. Can I simplify it to be a basic rule? Yeah. Um, just think of that denominator as a u to the one half divided into each part. I get u to the one half minus u to the minus one half. Then I can do a power rule. And so add one to the power, divide by the new power. Add one to the power, divide by the new power. So now I know my u was um, one plus x squared. So I can have, this is two thirds, one plus x squared to the, th to the three halves minus two times one plus x squared to the one half plus C, and that would be my answer. Okay. So that would be how to take care of that integral, okay? It's one way, but here's another way. Um, you can make your substitution a little bit more sophisticated and kind of get rid of this messy algebra. So maybe I'll do this like side by side so you can see. So here, instead, I have my i equals, you know, um, this use x squared times x dx over the radical of 1 plus x squared. But here, I'll just make a slight modification to my substitution, and you're going to see it's going to actually be a little bit nicer. Just do a u squared equals this. So it's like taking the U to be the radical, but I write it without the radicals because I, I, for whatever reason, don't want to do radicals. Here, this is going to be a 2U DU. It gives me 2X DX. Of course, these guys, you can cancel the twos off. It's not going to matter. But now you can see that that X DX is just U DU. That's going to be that x dx. My x squared is just going to be u squared minus 1. And in the denominator, I would just have a u, because my u is actually the square root. Now. My u's would, of course, cancel. Like I can cancel this u with that u. And I have this integral left over, u squared minus 1 du. Right? So obviously, it's already nicer than this scenario I have here. Just by tweaking my substitution a little bit, 
here, now this is going to be a u cubed over three minus u plus c. And I know that my uh, u was the radical. So this is gonna be one plus x squared to the three halves over three minus one plus x squared to the one half plus c. So you see here, you can make things actually a lot nicer just by tweaking your substitution a little bit. So Okay, so trig substitution. does this in certain situations. Um, for example, let's look at this example. What if this were an x squared instead of that x cubed? Then you'd realize that you're actually in trouble here because if you do a u equals a one plus x squared or you did a u squared equals a one plus x squared, it actually won't help you very much because your du is going to give you that two uh, x dx. Whereas here you'd have your two u du gives you x dx, two x dx. In both scenarios, you have this x dx term here where you have like an x squared. And you might think, well, that's not a big deal. Just think of it as x times x. But the problem is here, your x in this case is a radical, right? It'll be a radical you know, plus or minus u minus one. Whereas here, your x is going to be a radical u squared minus one. And um, both of these leads to a messy integral leads to an integral we can't solve yet. So you're in a scenario where kind of something that worked in a slightly different situation doesn't work now because Having an odd power here was nice because once you factored off one of the X's to get your substitution to work, the even power made it nicer to kind of swap things out. Uh, you don't have that scenario here. So you end up in the situation where, yeah, your substitution or what you would think of in the typical case versus being a little bit more sophisticated doesn't really help you out. Um, but there's going to be a way and you're going to see that we can actually make this um, work out a little bit nicer. So don't despair. Um, consider this. And at the point, at this point, you're probably not going to realize how does this help. Um, but we know that 1 minus sine squared, for example, is a cosine squared, right? Nothing fancy about that. In fact, I could multiply both sides by like a, an a squared. And something like this could happen, right? And let's say I think of my x as being this a sine theta. What this kind of means is that if I have a squared minus x squared, 
I can think of this as an a squared cosine theta. So I have something like this being equivalent to something like this. And that's really nice because on the left side, there are two terms. There's a sum of things. On the right side, there's only one thing, right? Right? Or we have that situation where we had the one plus tangent gives us the secant squared. Right, of course, a squared plus a squared ten squared would give us the um, uh, a squared secant squared. So notice that if we think of x as being equivalent to a tangent, then what you end up with is a squared plus x squared gives us a squared secant squared, and if you say, for example, a equals one, you'll notice that what this is saying is one plus x squared can be thought of as a single trig function. And if you think of applying this to something like, this, you'll realize that this part here can become a single term, namely a secant squared, right? And the fact that you turn something under a radical from a sum to a single term can actually make things a lot easier, a lot nicer. And we're actually going to use this idea to transform this integral into something a lot easier to deal with when our regular substitution can't deal with it. Of course, as you're probably noticing, we're going to use trig functions in order to do this. And we just spent a whole section working out how to actually integrate things with trig functions. And so this is going to be, this is the motivation for trig substitution. So I kind of want you to see what sort of considerations brought us here, right? So we have scenarios where, you know, it might, it feels like a substitution can work and make things nicer, but the regular way we think about substitutions don't work. However, if we get a little bit more sophisticated than we're used to and start plugging in a function that's just more convenient, like here, plugging in a u squared instead of a u, plugging in a quadratic instead of a linear function was more convenient. You can actually put this method on steroids. Why plug in a polynomial at all? Why not plug in a trig function? Why not plug in a hyperbolic trig function? Why not plug in some other kind of function? They're gonna be, when you start thinking on that level, like my substitution doesn't just have to be a u equals, I can make u like anything that's convenient. A whole new world opens up. And one of the first, one of the easiest such worlds to understand is the trig world, right? Let's make our substitution a trig substitution. Instead of plugging in a U, let's plug in a trig function. It'll allow us to collapse certain cases from two terms to one term, and that can actually have a great impact. So I'm going to show you that impact when we get back, <laughs> right? Just stay tuned after this commercial break. I, I feel like I could have done that nicer, you know, they keep you on the edge of your seats. So we'll take a five minute break here again. And uh, when we come back, we're going to do trig substitution, going to teach you how it's going to work. And we'll do a couple examples. And I'll leave some for you to do for next class. So we will pause here for a moment. All right, so we're back. Let's uh... And everything seems to be in order here. Okay, so let's uh, see how this is going to work. So don't worry. If I confuse you with the motivation, don't worry about it. I'm going to tell you like how you want to apply the thing that I was just trying to explain. So um, here are uh, I want to 
let's see this. Mean formulas behind trig substitution. So here's we know um, which implies and And like I was doing, replacing x with an appropriate trig function. Okay, so here's how it works. We know that one minus sine squared equals cosine squared. Okay, no one would question that. Um, this also means that a squared minus what I mentioned earlier, a, let me write it in a different way though, a sine theta is equal to a squared cosine squared, which means if I let my x be this guy, then what I'm saying is an expression like a squared minus x squared could be thought of as equivalent to something like a squared cosine squared. Similarly, I could have something like um, one plus tangent squared. I know that gives me secant squared. Of course, that implies that a squared plus a tangent is equal to a squared secant squared. So if I think of this guy as x, basically what I just learned is an expression like a squared plus x squared can be thought of as equivalent to some secant function. Um, I also know that uh, secant squared minus one equals tangent squared, which means that a secant theta squared minus a squared is equal to a squared tangent squared. But that also implies that if I were to let this guy be an x, that tells me an expression like x squared minus a squared can be thought of as equivalent to some tangent function. Okay. So here's how trig sub works. We're going to kind of use this idea of we're able to think of certain expressions in terms of trig functions to kind of get a substitution to work. So at the end, the upshot is this. If you see expressions that look like the, those guys in the rightmost column of the previous table, you can make certain substitutions. If you see an expression like this, you can make this substitution. So if you see an expression like a squared minus x squared, you can actually do the substitution x equals a sine theta. And it turns out that would invoke this thing occurring, which gets you to a nice scenario that's on the right side. Um, by the way, uh, x equals a cosine theta would work similarly. 
but it's not very traditional to use cosine because then you get a negative when you start to find dx and that sort of thing. So the, the standard way is to use a sine function for the x. Okay. Now, on top of that, there's something else that it comes in handy is x substitution. Oh, back substitution, if you haven't heard that phrase before, hopefully you have. That's when you plug in back the original. So this step here, this step is called a back substitution. Right? Because you made you made a substitution to get this answer but then you have to get the original variable back, right? So you do a back substitution or a reverse substitution um, to get the answer to the original variables. So essentially what you're doing here is we're going to use a substitution to go from a variable X to a variable theta. So there's gonna come a point where we're gonna get answers in the variable theta and we'll need to actually get the original variable back, right? So that's called back substitution. But because your back, your back substitution isn't going to be as straightforward as, oh, just replace all these variables with blah, because you have like these old trig identities that you have to go through. So you just have to be aware that there are some, going to be some things that show up in the back substitution case. So if your x is equal to a sine theta, this would, of course, means x over a would be sine theta sine theta. So this means you can have this uh, triangle that comes into play where you have opposite over hypotenuse and you have this thing. So you'd have uh, a squared minus x squared here. And from that, you can figure out, um, you know, for example, what the cosine of theta might look like, right? So that would be like adjacent over hypotenuse or what a tangent would look like, right? That would be an opposite over adjacent, et cetera, right? So if your answer has a tangent in it, you know you can replace the tangent with this sort of expression, right? So the back substitution is a little bit more complicated, right? But essentially it's just trigonometry. You set up your right triangle, you can figure out, I can replace each trig function with this expression of X. Right. So, of course, the other one, or the there are two more scenarios, right? You have the a squared plus x squared. In this case, a nice substitution to use is to think of the x as a tangent, right? And of course, the the triangle that's going to be useful there is the fact that you have an x over a equals a tangent. So this is opposite over adjacent. So this is going to be the square root of a squared plus x squared. And that triangle will help you figure out any other trig function that shows up in your answer. I can use this triangle and Soka Toa to figure out how to back substitute. The last one is x squared minus a squared. Now, if you see an expression like that, you are allowed to do a substitution like this use a secant, right? And that would transform this expression to look like a single tangent expression. And of course, you would have x over a is a secant. So your triangle is going to look like hypotenuse over adjacent. And so this is going to be x squared minus a squared. Right? And this is uh, literally the backbone behind um, trig substitution. If you see expressions like guys on the left, you can make a substitution like the middle column. And again, you're beyond this is just regular substitution. So you have x equals something, you're going to find dx 
in terms of d theta and all that. Everything else is just a regular substitution. It's just that initial step is going to be this. Once the initial substitution is made, uh, follow through like a regular substitution problem. using the triangles with Sokotoa um, helps to um, back substitute to the original variable. when necessary. Okay, so this I'm going to um, talk about when the time is appropriate. The idea is gonna be, obviously you have to go through this whole thing to do the back substitution. And that's kind of solving like a mini trig problem sometimes. So the idea is there are going to be situations where you might not want to do the back substitution if you don't have to. And this is pretty much going to be um, scenarios where you have definite integrals, and we'll actually get into that. So essentially, when you're doing trig sub, I would not recommend the whole back substitution process if you have a definite integral. It's only necessary um, or indefinite integrals. If you have a definite integral, I would recommend that you change the limits instead and skip the whole back substitution phase. Just get your limits in terms of thetas and just plug directly into the thetas. And that's going to give you save you a lot of work um, than going through the actual substitution. Um, so that's the idea. So for now, I would just say, I don't know, snap a photo of this or have this uh, on the notes or something, because we're going to be using this table. Um, the idea is when I see something like the guy on the left, I will make a substitution like the second column. And it's going to be hopefully a nicer situation. So let's do some examples. First example, let's say I have something like this, x squared over the square root of four minus x squared. Notice that this is a similar situation to this guy that was giving us trouble earlier, right? Because I have an even power on the top, even power under the radical. It's not going to, it's not gonna succumb to a typical substitution um, as if there were just an x or an x cubed on the top. So we're kind of in this situation. Now, what you can realize is that um, this expression here, note four minus x squared, I can think of that as two squared minus x squared, which is like an a squared minus x squared with a equals two, right? So that's the first thing you're gonna notice, right? I can write the constant as a square. And by the way, it doesn't have to be a perfect square. If this were three, I could just think of my A as a radical three and nothing changes much, right? Other than you're just writing down a radical for a constant, which doesn't affect anything much anyway. Okay, so that's the first thing. So 
I would probably say, this is just for emphasis, but I do want to hit home that actually the first thing you would think, is this a basic rule? Two, can I simplify it? can substitution work? All right, and the answer to all of these would be no. All right, now, of course, at this point, you have other alternatives. You have, you know, integration by parts at this point, but in this case, what would your parts be, right? Like U equals X squared, DV equals one over the radical, like, come on, right? You're, you probably wouldn't think integration by parts for something like this. So here, the fourth thing you think would be for you to note this. Oh, I have an expression here that's a difference of squares, right? A squared minus X squared. And I know that is a convenient expression to have. Whenever I have such an expression, I can think of the X as a sine function. So that's where you're going to actually go into your trig sub. So here, the required trig sub would be 2 sine theta. Right? Because it's a squared minus x squared. A in this case is 2. Now, of course, at this point, everything else is just a regular substitution. So I need to find the dx all that. So that means dx is going to be the derivative of this. And you're gonna go back and plug in. So if I call this i, for example, my integral i is going to look like this. I have an x squared on top. That x squared is now two sine theta squared. My dx is now two cosine theta d theta. And underneath here, I would have four minus two sine theta squared. So this part here is my x squared. This part here is my dx, and this part here, of course, is x. So other than this, just throwing in a, a, trig sum, a trig function into the mix, everything else is just a regular substitution. I'm swapping everything out just as I normally do. And that's, that's essentially it. Now, of course, your denominator is going to contract into a very nice situation because what's under the radical is now going to be a four cosine squared theta. Make this a four sine squared theta times two cosine theta d theta, right? Because I know a squared minus a sine theta all squared contracts to a squared cosine squared. That's what I know from this table, right? So I know once I make the substitution, what happens is going to be the right side of this takes effect. But of course, now that's just, uh, I mean, you don't have to write this line, I guess, if you see that it cancels right away. But that simplifies to a two cosine, which you can cancel. And now you sort of end up with this integral. So we went from something that looks horrendous, that would be not nice. You won't have a good time actually working this out with a regular substitution. X squared divided by the radical of four minus X squared, but thinking of my x as a trig function, suddenly this is just 
a very nice integral. Okay. Nice in the sense that we know exactly how to deal with this guy. We actually were dealing with it earlier. You apply the half angle form, the double angle formula. And that's going to be your answer. We're, we're essentially done with the integration. Okay. So making this trig substitution, it reduces to something very nice, albeit a trig function. But we just did an entire section where we learned how to integrate all sorts of trig functions. So we know what to do. Doing that, um, you end up in a scenario where, yeah, I can integrate this easily. However, there is an issue. Right now, we have our answer in terms of theta, right? Um, and this is an indefinite integral. We want to give our answers in terms of x. So at this point, you need to back substitute. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, we're gonna use this triangle essentially to kind of figure out the things we would need. So this means we know that, um, you know, X over, our X was two sine theta. So this means X over two is equal to sine theta. This means I can set up this triangle because sine is opposite over hypotenuse. That's going to make this here four minus X squared, which implies a few things. For one, it implies that cosine theta is going to be one half this radical. Of course, we know that sine theta is going to be X over two, which by the way, means that your theta itself is going to be an inverse function, sine inverse x over two, okay? And so now what we can do is we can go and swap these out. Uh, of course, you'd want to recall that sine two theta, which is a part of our answer, it's a double angle, is going to be two sine theta cosine theta. So my one half sine two theta is going to be sine theta times cosine theta. Which in this case, I know what those guys are. This is going to be the sine is X over two. The cosine is this radical over two. So this is just going to be X over four times this radical. So now I have everyone that I can swap out. So this will become two times theta, which is going to be a sine inverse X over two minus one half sine two theta, which we know is going to be X over four radical four minus X squared. And that's gonna be your answer. So notice that this, I mean, it's not hard, but it is not like totally trivial. Like it takes a while sometimes to figure out the back substitution. It's a, like a whole other trick problem unto itself. So you'll be highly motivated to skip back substitution whenever you can get away with it. And so a nice situation in which you can get away with it is when you have a definite integral. So you definitely don't want to do this unless you have to. But in this case, um, that's where we are. So we have something like this. Very nasty to do with a uh, regular substitution. I mean, in terms of integration by parts, like I would, it wouldn't even come to mind, honestly. Um, however, with a trig substitution, we end up with this integral, which we know how to deal with very easily. 
And then just using a triangle in Sokotoa, we can get our answer back in terms of X. So ultimately, you know, that's, that's what our integral looks like there. Okay, so um, let's actually do some more examples. Oh, before that, uh, any questions on anything that happened here? Are you okay? So you apply the trig substitution based on the kind of expression you have. The four minus x squared looks like an a squared minus x squared. So getting a sine function in there is convenient. After that, you just do a regular substitution, get into substitution mode, do what you got to do. You'll end up with a, fun a trig function to integrate. We know how to integrate trig functions now. So you just do what you gotta do to integrate the trig function. Then in the event that you have to back substitute, you just, you set up your triangle and that will help you back substitute. So your answer can have all kinds of trig functions present, um, but the triangle can help you figure out any of the trig functions using Sokoto, right? So let's look at some more examples, which, I mean, we're not going to finish all of them today, but whatever we have left over, I'll leave those for you to try for tomorrow's class. Uh, yes, we know this is a basic rule. But let's derive the answer using trick sub. What is that intro, by the way? Integral of one over one plus X squared. What is that? It's actually the arc tangent. It's arc 10x. Um, there's another one. X squared plus 4x plus 8.
So whatever we don't get to, I'll leave till uh, class tomorrow. So just focus on one at a time. Okay, so we have this guy, which uh, we know is just the arc tangent function. But let's say, you know, you're in a test, hell freezes over, whatever, you end up in like an alternative dimension and you don't remember that, you should. But let's say you don't, right? Um, it turns out that you have another option. You can actually figure this out from scratch now in a way that is a little bit more straightforward than going through the trig function way because, you know, how would you think trick functions from this initially? So um, the idea here is that your A is essentially one, right? Okay. So you would actually just do the required trick substitution here, which is actually a tangent, right? So we know from our table here, that whenever we see something like the sum of squares, a squared plus x squared, letting your x equals a tangent theta is a convenient thing to do, which is what we have in this scenario. And again, of course, you go through that whole thing. This is a basic rule, which in this case it is. Technically, you would know the answer here already. If not, you can assemble this to be a basic rule. Uh, what does regular substitution work? Obviously a substitution is not gonna work because you do u equals one plus x squared. Your du is gonna give you a two x dx. Where's the x dx? You don't have it. So you're in another situation now where a trig sub is actually pretty useful to do. Um, so here you just set x equals tan theta. So this would mean your dx, the derivative of tangent is secant squared. And you would just go and you would plug this in. So in the bottom, you would have one plus tan squared. And your dx would just be secant squared. Of course, one plus tan squared is secant squared. The secants would cancel. You would just have the integral of one d theta integrate one d theta, of course you get theta plus c. What is theta? Well, x was tan theta, which means theta is just tan inverse of x. And we've re-derived the, uh, the formula using trig sub. That's another example. So, which is, it's more of a warm up um, because, you know, we think this is something you should know by heart. Let's get to something a little bit um, nastier, probably. I mean, it looks like it's going to be worse. So you see something like this thing, it's like, yuck, okay? It's not a basic rule. What am I gonna simplify to look like a basic rule? Would a regular substitution work? You'd probably wanna substitute what's under the radical, like u equals x squared minus three or u squared equals x squared minus three. Of course, your du is gonna give you an x. Where is the x, right? Sure, you can multiply and divide by x, but then you get an x cubed in the denominator. Like what? Like, how are you gonna deal with the x cubed? If your u was this x squared, blah, 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 right? You have to like take this radical cube both sides. It's, it's going to be a mess. So substitution, the regular iteration of substitution isn't going to work. However, um, you notice that x squared minus 3, I can think of this as x squared minus rad 3 squared. So this means that my a is rad 3. And I can kind of get trig functions into here to help me out. So I would say my x is equal to radical three secant theta. Why radical three secant theta? Because now my iPad is passing out. Because we know that when we have x squared minus a squared, 
the secant is a convenient thing to use because it allows us to get a tangent in there. So that's going to be the substitution. Um, of course, dx is going to be radical three, derivative of secant is secant theta tan theta, d theta. So we go in and we plug those in. So we have one divided by x squared would be three secant squared theta. x squared minus three, that's gonna end up being three tan squared theta. And then my secant theta tan theta, grad three secant theta tan theta. So, of course, this, the rad three tan is going to cancel this, and the secant is going to cancel one of these guys. So I just end up with one third one over secant theta. How do we integrate one over secant? Ideas for one over secant? Anyone? Bueller? Getting late in the day, isn't it? Well, one over secant is just cosine. Integral of cosine is just uh, sine. Now you have to go through that whole back substitution thing. We know that um, x over at three is secant. Of course, this means rad three over x is gonna be your cosine. So using Sokoto, we can set up this triangle, um, adjacent over hypotenuse. This is gonna be the radical of the hypotenuse squared minus the adjacent squared. And so this means that my sine theta is opposite over hypotenuse. And so, one third sine theta is just that guy. One third sine. That's going to be my integral. I call this guy I. So that's going to be that one. And I mean, we're pretty much out of time here. So I'll just say, try these for next time. And actually try them. So, I mean, we're starting to get into the weeds here a little bit, and I do appreciate that. So don't feel weird if you're still a little bit confused or shaky on what we're doing. Like we're actually doing some pretty sophisticated stuff. So, you know, 
I might have lost some of you there with the integral of secant cubed like two hours ago. <laughs> and now you're just like holding off for dear life. It's completely normal. Just make sure you actually put in some of the work, try some problems tonight and kind of get these methods into your head. Um, and if you're still confused tomorrow, you can ask me some questions about it. But I would say definitely uh, make sure you try these and try to apply, you know, the trig substitution methods that we've been doing in the event. I would say not to back substitute for F. Try to see if you can figure out how to change the limits and, and to avoid back substitution. But for now, we're going to wrap up there and uh, I'd want you to try those things for tomorrow. Because you'd want to know if you really understand or if you don't understand. Um, one thing is just, just watching me solve problems. Even if you get what I'm doing at every step, it's not the same as doing it on your own. Like it'll make complete sense to you and then you'll go on a test and not know what to do. So you have to put in the work on your own. But other than that, uh, we'll stop there. So you guys know how to find the notes. So you'll know how to find these guys here. Um, but we're gonna stop there. Any last questions before we go? Any quick question? Uh, yeah. Nadia, yes, that you just put in the chat. Um, yeah. So I guess you can email me and uh, we'll figure it out. Okay, so I'll okay. hang around. Any, any other questions from anyone else? Okay, so that being said, I will uh, let you guys go. So um, yeah, have a good night and I'll see you guys in the next one. Ciao.